let's go ahead and get started. The, um, first of all, when we speak of Chumash Indians, it's actually what we're doing is speaking of people who spoke about uh, six different languages in our area. They all belong to the same language family, which we call Chumash. But actually, the uh, word Chumash, um, uh, to, as it's used today, refers to uh, anyone speaking these six different languages. And so they're shown here. We're not sure about the Kuyama people, what they spoke. But uh, in general, we, the, their Chumash languages can be divided into three branches. All right, they're, and they're really different from each other. Uh, so you would need a translator in order for people, you know, from San Luis Obispo to understand someone from Santa Barbara. They couldn't, it was like Dutch and German, or a Dutch and English in the Germanic language family. Two completely different languages you'd need a translator to understand. And then uh, island Chumash is, is the, the branches are the northern Chumash up here, uh, the island Chumash, and then the central Chumash region, all of these different groups, uh, at least these four different groups were, were distinct enough in their language to be considered separate languages rather than just dialects, even though there was a certain amount of uh, relatedness between these languages in here. So when, you, when people talk about Chumash Indians, it's kind of glossing over a lot of uh, variability. The most populous uh, region was the coastal region, right along the Santa Barbara Channel uh, mainland coast. And this was the highest population density in all of Aboriginal California, it was right here in the Santa Barbara Channel coast. So it, it tells us about the productivity of the marine environment that we have here in the Santa Barbara Channel, because these people were living off of fishing. Um, these were they're hunter-gatherer fishermen. There's no agriculture being practiced. It's all hunting, gathering, and fishing economy and the people along the coast especially were concentrating on marine resources. So this is a photograph I took out of the airplane window as I'm leaving the Santa Barbara airport and looking down on uh, there's the the airport runway and this area right here uh, between uh, well right around the UCSB campus, between UCSB campus and Goleta proper, all of that was a, a large coastal lagoon at the time that Europeans arrived. And what looked a lot like what Morro Bay looks like today. And so this is, if we go back in time, this would be a view of the Goleta Valley as Chumash Indians uh, understood it. There was this large lagoon that was here Here's where UCSB campus sits today. Uh, there were four major uh, settlements around the lagoon, each with its own name. So each, these would be the, the tribes of the Chumash. Each local community, each local rancheria, as the Spanish called them, were their social political group. They were like independent of others. Uh, in other words, California generally, and the Chumash region, uh, it's kind of, some people draw the analogy to Greek city-states. We have this local level um, uh, tribes throughout California, small scale local level tribes, and they're independent from each other. And then uh, these are place names along the coast that mean different things, like Wokwoko means there's lots of tar. And if you've ever hiked along Goleta Beach, east of the inlet to the Goleta Sioux, you'll see there's lots of tar that's coming out there. Um, Tip tip means lots of salt. That what's now the lagoon at UCSB campus was apparently a salt flat, and they called it lots of salt. The Galita Point, Sisniku, means a place of the mussels. And if you go out there at low tide today, you'll see there's lots of mussels on those rocks. So the Chumash place names were very descriptive of the their environment. And and by the way, Devereaux Slough has an interesting name here. It, Ukshulo, it means uh, stagnant water, <laughs> or smelly water, actually, in, in their language. Cut from the, I guess, brackish water that was in that area. So this would be an artist's uh, vision of what the Goleta uh, Valley looked like at the time that Chumash Indians were there. There was a large island 
in the center of the lagoon, uh, which had houses on it, and then there were communities surrounding the Goleta Lagoon. And this it was the highest population density in Chumash territory. So the, the Chumash were the highest population density, coastal Chumash, in all of Aboriginal California, and within Chumash territory, the Goleta Valley was where the greatest number of people were living. Chumash Indians uh, are known for their plank canoes. Um, they, were, they were very seaworthy watercraft, only used along the whole coast or anywhere in North America. The only place that boats made out of planks were constructed. They would, driftwood logs would come ashore, redwood or pine, and they would split these into planks, uh, shape the wood, drill them, sew them together, and then seal the, the uh, seams of the boards with, with tar, or kind of a tar pine mix uh, that would, would glue them together. And these were very seaworthy watercraft and, and um, very important in Chumash culture. And what we can do is uh, actually figure out how important they were by using the observations of the first Spanish land expedition, the Portola expedition of 1769. And the, the, the people who kept journals in that expedition record how many people were in each Chumash town that they encountered as they came from Ventura all the way up around Point Conception. And they also, at each town, they counted the number of plank canoes present in each town. And when you run the numbers, you'll see each of these plank canoes is feeding about 40 people. So the, the fishing that was going on uh, was feeding about 40 people each plank canoe. So these are a very important part of Chumash culture, and the owners of those plank canoes had a relatively high political status. And that opening slide that you saw of is, is based on uh, a painting. Uh, because this is an earlier sketch uh, based on that same painting. Uh, for that painting, by the way, first appeared in National Geographic magazine. But it's based on a um, uh, actual first-hand description in 1776 of the Anza expedition. When they visited Santa Barbara, they saw these men out fishing. And they came ashore uh, with their boat load of fish, lifted it on their shoulders, and carried it to the owner of the boat, this man here, who was distinguished by his, his bearskin cape, you know, as he wore kind of the uh, symbol of his uh, prestige in the society. And so, uh, these, these boat owners, by the fact they're feeding so many people and by the fact that those boats were the transportation between the islands and the mainland with all the trade that was going back and forth, uh, these boat owners were of high status position in uh, Chumash, coastal Chumash society. Now, that, so the Tomal is one thing you want to remember, uh, uh, one of the important, uh, most important uh, pieces of material culture of the Chumash. Another is the fact that the Chumash Indians made money out of shell beads, uh, or out of shells. This shell here, the Alabella biplicata, and you, they would make an incredible variety of little tiny beads out of different parts of this shell. And depending upon what part of the shell and, and how much work went into making the bead, it was worth more money. But it was a standardized medium of exchange. Uh, this money uh, was traded throughout the territory where people spoke Chumash languages, but also traded to their neighbors and throughout California. So Chumash bead money is found all throughout Southern California, all the way up the Central Valley, up into the Sacramento Valley of California. Uh, archaeologically, we can see that the, the money was changing hands from group to group and being used as a medium of exchange. And anthropologists ha have noticed that uh, this is the only place that that California is the only place north of Mexico where true money was developed in, in Aboriginal North America. And uh, so that, uh, and the mint for making this money were the Chumash, but not just any Chumash, the Chumash of the Channel Islands. In fact, the word for bead money, let me show you some bead. Here's the stages of manufacture. Here's the olivella shell, fracturing it out, making a little blank and beginning to drill it and then smoothing it out uh, around the periphery to make them these little disks. And uh, Chumash, uh, uh, the, the name in the Chumash language 
or in the different Chumash languages, was Alchum or Anchum, depending on which language you spoke. And Chumash comes from the word for bead money. And the original word Chumash did not mean all these people speaking these related languages. It originally was designated for the people of the Channel Islands because the Channel Island Indians were the one who were making the bead money. That's where all the olivella shells are so common, is around our Channel Islands, and then it would be uh, produ uh, produced out there. And um, there were uh, certain village sites, if you go there today, that are just covered, littered, with all the little pieces of detritus from making bead, bead money. You know, it was just a household industry on the Channel Islands. Everybody was producing beads this money. It was the, the mint for not only the Chumash, for, for most of Aboriginal California. And, uh, and Chumash bead money is also found into the Great Basin and all the way into the Pueblo Indians of the Rio Grande River, they found uh, Chumash uh, bead money. But in order to, to drill the beads, there was also a specialized technology that was needed to make the beads. And that was these little tiny slivers of stone that you see here. These are what are called uh, bladelet drills or micro drills. And these were, uh, it, it takes a special, uh, you know, training in order to make these. And these are the cores. You can see they have these little scars, linear scars running on them that were where they, they popped off these uh, bladelets. Uh, and then, the, so there were, there were villages on Santa Cruz Island, eastern Santa Cruz Island, where um, these, uh, these micro drills were being produced. So some villages were, were specializing in production of micro drills, other villages were specializing in production of bead money. And this is just a map showing the circulation of uh, shell beads. Here's the Santa Barbara region. And then all the way up here is where the um, bead money is, is found in California. Now there were other kinds of, other portions of California, they made different kinds of bead money uh, up here and up here, but the Olivella bead money made on the Channel Islands had the, had the widest distribution throughout California. Now I mentioned that the Chumash Indians, or did I mention that Chumash Indians didn't practice agriculture. In fact, no California Indian groups practiced agriculture except along the Colorado River. Uh, you know, where the Mojave and the Quechan Indians were, were, were planting corn and, and maize, uh, I mean maize and beans and squash along in the river floodplain. Uh, so the California Indians harvested wild seeds and wild grains and nuts uh, for their uh, sustenance. And here's some women out with their, look like tennis rackets. These are seed beaters they use to heat, hit the heads of the dried, uh, seed pods on the plants to knock the seeds into their baskets. And here's a photograph of an exhibit we have at our museum. Here's a, a Chumash carved wooden bowl. You can see very beautiful. It's, it's actually the only surviving example in this country of a, a carved wooden bowl. There's several that are in Paris at a museum there, but this is the only uh, one in this country. You can see it's decorated with shell beads around the rim, very fine workmanship. And then these are some of the baskets with the different uh, seeds that the Chumash Indians were, were gathering. And uh, like, all, uh, like most California Indians, one of the staples of the diet were acorns. And so they would, all the acorns we have growing on this campus here, these are all, there's a good year for acorns. Did you notice that? They're really productive. Uh, I know at our museum, all of our acorns, all of our oak trees really produced a lot of acorns. And so they would harvest the, uh, the nuts or the, or the acorns, um, crack them, take out the meat that's inside, uh, then pound them up in these, these mortars like you see here, and uh, then uh, leach the, the, the flour to get rid of the tannins and the acids and then make them uh, edible. And this was done all up and down California. Um, Okay, another thing to remember about Chumash Indians, besides bead money and besides the tomal, is they made really high quality uh, basketry. This was, women were the ones that had the, were the experts in the textile arts among the Chumash. And so these are some of examples of, of uh, Chumash basketry shown in the uh, photograph here. You can see they're just, they're beautiful. 
And the Spanish, uh, when they were here, they would trade for these baskets because they, they, they thought they were such, you know, they were so excellently made. So a lot of these baskets ended up uh, down in, in Mexico, uh, were taken back by some of the Spanish explorers and visitors. Uh, they, but it wasn't just basketry or those finely made stone mortars. They also made uh, carved uh, little cups and bowls out of serpentine. And it was, comes from the outcrops in the San Inez Valley, in the San Rafael Mountains. And so these are examples of some carved, uh, beautifully carved little serpentine cups and bowls. Okay, we've talked about some things that Chumash Indians are famous for. They're bead money, plank canoe, the basketry, but also their rock paintings. The Chumash have a worldwide reputation for the spectacular rock art that's found in their territory. And how many here have, have been to San Painted Cave on San Marcos Pass? Okay, so you all have an assignment <laughs> that in the coming weeks, uh, just take a little drive up San Marcos Pass. It's a state park. Anyone can, can go, uh, get, turn right on Painted Cave Road from Highway 154, and you wind up the side of the mountain, and you can stop and go and see this, uh, pa these paintings that I'm showing you here. This is Painted Cave uh, State Park. And uh, these paintings were, um, and this is one of the, one of the very famous uh, sites in Chumash territory. Uh, you can see that their polychrome paintings, red and black and white, are all used as pigment. Uh, there's some repeated motifs, like we have these circular designs that you see here, and many of them, you'll notice, are divided into four. And we're not sure what all that means. Is it the, are they, uh, many American Indians would, would pray to the four directions. The four directions are very symbolic. Is that what that's representing, or does it mean something else? We just don't know. Uh, and then there's these figures here, these black and white figures. Uh, so they're, they're maybe meant to represent uh, supernatural figures. Uh, but we don't really have any or very uh, many clues as to what these, these pictographs represented in Chumash culture. But they're found widespread throughout the region where Chumash languages are spoken. Um, and including Westmont College. How many of you were aware that you have a rock art site right in front of your library? About a few of you are. And this is it here. Uh, it's very faded, uh, but it's there if you look closely. And uh, this, I've darkened this image a little bit so you can see it more clearly. But you see, here's, a, here's some figure here. It's kind of striped. And he has, looks like maybe feet coming out on the back and a tail. I'm not sure what all of this is meant to represent, but uh, you've got a pictograph site right here on Westmont College campus, right in front of your library, Bosco Library. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, in Chumash uh, religion, their most important ceremony was conducted at the winter solstice, and they conceived of this as the time when the sun was reborn. They called it, it was the rebirth of the sun took place. and. Um, and many, many uh, American Indians uh, celebrated the winter solstice as being a very special time. The Hopi Indians, for example, in Arizona, and the Chumash Indians did it well, as well. And they had a special staff that you see here with painted design on it. This one is one that was found in a cave in the late 19th century and is at the Peabody Museum in Harvard. Uh, and um, they called this stick, uh, in their language, Okshposhinash. <laughs> and or miwalaksh, which means to divide or separate in the middle. And they also gave this name, according to the ethnographic information, to the North Star, Polaris, the North Star as well. And they said the reason why they had the same name is because when they would mount the staff during the ceremony at midday, that the shadow would go point due north uh, towards the North Star. So we know from the ethnographic accounts that there were uh, elderly Indians who were interviewed in the early 20th century who remembered uh, around Christmas time, right around the time of the winter solstice, that there were, elderly to, there were a couple elderly men who would go into the mountains and make paintings. So we suspect that some of these, this is one clue we have, some of these paintings were renewed or enhanced or new paintings were added 
you know, during the winter solstice uh, ceremonies that were being conducted. And these are some other examples of Chumash rock art site. This one's on the uh, Sierra Madre Ridge back in Los Padres Forest. Here's a figure here, and then there's this kind of uh, uh, de decorated circle here and above him to the upper right. This one is an artist's reconstruction, but it's at another cave that's in the San Rafael wilderness. Again, you have this figure, and there's a representation of this star-like uh, figure to up to its upper right. And it turns out that this is a repeated motif that we see in many parts of Chumash territory. And it, it could have some significance. Uh, one of the ideas is that this represents the North Star. And remember, that's the, um, one of the things that had the name of that special staff that was used at the time of the winter solstice. But the paintings are also uh, of other things. This is a painting of a swordfish. See, here's his tail. He's black on red. Here's his sword. Here's his dorsal fin. Uh, and this is at our site up on what is today Vandenberg Air Force Base. And uh, what is the significance of the swordfish in Chumash culture? Well, the Chumash believed that all the animals on land had their counterparts in the ocean. The, the ocean realm and the land realm were, were comparable. And, uh, for example, do you all know what a Jew Jerusalem cricket is? Those potato bugs? See them in your garden? You know what, what I'm talking about? Yeah, kind of ugly looking. <laughs> anyway, those, those are uh, the counterpart of lobsters that were in the ocean. The, um, the lizards are the counterpart of sardines in the ocean. The gopher snake has its counterpart in the barracuda. They're all long, narrow fish. And the counterpart of human beings are the swordfish. The swordfish, they, the Chimash believe, were the chief of all the creatures of the sea, were the swordfish. And the, the whale was the mother of the sea, but the swordfish was the, um, was the chief. And there was a swordfish dance. And here's a man, um, oh, about 20 years ago or so, performing a swordfish dance at, a, at the Museum of Natural History. He, he recreated the dance after reading some of the ethnographic notes and, and made his own swordfish costume. And notice he has a sword on his headdress. Um, and this man here, this is Vincent Tumamaya. Uh, he's no longer living, but Vincent Tumamaya was three, three quarters Chumash. Partly of his ancestry came from Santa Cruz Island and Santa Rosa Island. And he's holding a sword of a swordfish that's been carved. The whole handle's been carved. And we don't think that this one was part of a headdress, but it was part, we think those, that's a digging stick. And they would, uh, Chumash Indians made these circular stones, look like donuts, we call them donut stones, and they would be mounted over a stick, and that would give it weight for digging. And so we think that this tool that he's holding in his hand is, the, um, is a sword that was used as a digging stick that had a, a donut stone mounted on it at one time. Now I mentioned that, that whales were the mothers of the sea. Well, the whales also um, were regarded, whenever they would come ashore, it's a feast time. That's a, that's a uh, all up and down the Pacific coast, actually, not just among the Chumash. But when a whale would beach near your village, uh, it would be um, a time of plenty. Because one of those whales could feed your whole village for like, if they were big enough, for several months. You know, if you could harvest enough meat and, and uh, oil from the, rendering the oil from the blubber, you could get uh, a lot of food from that. So it was, it was very uh, propitious when a whale would come ashore near you. And so there were uh, shamans in Chumash society that had little whale charms, these carved carvings of whales you can see here and here. And they, the Chumash had a name for these whale effigies. They called them... Um, Tsukwutui Ipaha, meaning it means shadow of the whale. It's the whale's shadow, these little effigies. And these, these uh, specialists, these whale dreamers, as they were called, would use these as, uh, and it was believed that they would magically uh, charm the whales into summon them to coming ashore. 
But it wasn't only the, the, the whale dreamers that would bring the whales ashore, that they believed that swordfish would drive the whales ashore to feed the people. And um, you say, well, that's kind of a curious uh, idea. But it's actually, it's true. Whale, swordfish, whales do attract, do attack uh, whales. Uh, there was a professor at Cal Poly um, San Luis Obispo who was a specialist in billfish, you know, swordfish and marlin. And he uh, shared with me a whole bibliography he had created of instances of um, swordfish attacking whales. Not only swordfish attacking whales, but swordfish attacking things that look like whales. So, you know, there was one ship that um, sunk and lost a big, lot, or at least lost part of its cargo of big bundles of rubber. And these bundles of rubber washed ashore in Africa full of broken off swords and from swordfish and marlin that had been, you know, stuck in them. So what makes the swordfish attack whales, we don't know. But this Chumash myth was not really a myth. It was actually based on uh, probably observation of having seen swordfish attack whales or finding whales embedded with a broken sword. Okay, so let's, uh, I've given you a little background about Chumash culture, and now I'd just like to walk through uh, what we know about the history uh, from the time of the coming of Europeans. Uh, the first European to encounter uh, Chumash Indians was Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo in 1542. And um, we have here on the right an interesting artifact that was found in 1900 on Santa Rosa Island. And it originally was covered with lichen all up in uh, here. But in the 1950s, it had, uh, the archaeologist at Berkeley, Robert Heitzer, uh, he was cleaning up this collection in order to put out a publication about this early work that had been done in 1900 by someone else. But he was, he was uh, publishing it for the first time. And in cleaning off the lichen, he noticed there's a cross right here in the upper left-hand corner. And then there's a carving. It says J-R with a little S on the end. J-R. And then down here, there's an there's a Indian petroglyph, a carving by the Indians. That's probably why it was originally uh, collected, because they saw this Indian carving on it. But um, he, this archaeologist said, well, wait a minute. Juan Rodriguez, that was his name, Cabrillo was sort of his nickname, Juan Rodriguez, maybe this is his gravestone because Cabrillo died and was buried on one of the Channel Islands. And uh, there's, there's a debate over which island it was, but, um, but e even if he had been buried on one island, it doesn't mean this was found on Santa Rosa, that he was buried there. They could have brought it from another island. Anyway, it, it's possible. It's got a cross, it's got his initials, Maybe that's Cabrillo's gravestone. So, anybody, are you, a lot of the younger people, are you old enough to remember Dallas? The series Dallas? Who shot J.R.? Oh, okay. Well, this is, you know, where was J.R. buried? You know, here. Never mind. <laughs> okay. This is, uh, the next major uh, explorer to encounter the Chumash was um, Sebastian Vizcaino in 1602. And uh, Vizcaino uh, came into the Santa Barbara Channel on uh, December 8th. Um, and, uh, is it December, is it the 8th? Yeah, I think it was around then. Anyway, St. Barbara's Day, right? That's why we're called Santa Barbara today. It's because Vizcaino was here on that day, December 4th, it's December 4th, yeah. St. Barbara's Day. And uh, in 1602, and so he named this area Santa Barbara after that saint, and that's why we're called Santa Barbara. Anyway, this is a sketch map from uh, his voyage uh, that shows the different Channel Islands off our coast, and then you can identify different places, including uh, Montecito, uh, where he mentions here that there's a, a large number of oaks growing, and that's. Uh, and do you know what Montecito means in Spanish? No. Anybody? Small you know what? Mountain, what mountain. Yeah, some people think it means mountain, but actually Montecito. Monte means forest. So Montecito is a small forest, you know, and he's, he's mentioning that uh, here in, uh, 
1603. Okay, so we'll move forward. There was very little contact after those first contacts by uh, Cabrillo and um, Vizcaino uh, until 1769. And the Spanish were worried about the Russians. They were worried about the Russians moving down from Alaska and colonizing California and thereby jeopardizing the Manila galleon trade. These, these galleons that would every year go to the Philippines and then come back across uh, the North Pacific and then down to Acapulco. They were worried that the, that uh, trade would be je uh, jeopardized by the um, by Russians if the Russians would get to, into California earlier, and so that made the the Crown decide that they should colonize California, and the best way to do that would be to send missionaries to build missions and convert the native people, and so the first uh, land expedition to go up was uh, instructed to found a mission in San Diego, the major harbor. And then the other harbor that, that this guy I know had talked about was Monterey. He missed San Francisco Bay entirely. But he, uh, so they went up and uh, founded a, their first mission in Alta California at San Diego, worked their way up the coast, uh, passing along the Santa Barbara Channel. And we have this wonderful diaries that are kept by the, the, the people who were along on the expedition. And then they reached Monterey. And they, they weren't very impressed with Monterey Bay. You know, they thought, gosh, this doesn't look like the right place. And so they continued searching north, and they bumped into San Francisco Bay. And that's when San Francisco Bay was discovered. OK, I'm digressing a bit, but it's an interesting story. <laughs> and so uh, we have these, these great diaries that give our first uh, uh, really detailed look at what Chumash culture was like before it was forever altered. And so those are they're really wonderful uh, accounts to, to read. And uh, in 1782 then, uh, they, were, they founded some missions to the south and some missions up to the north. But by 1782, they decided we needed, they needed to have missions down here along the main part of the Santa Barbara Channel because there was such a populous uh, area. And so this is a map that was uh, made at that time when they were founding both Mission San Buenaventura and the Santa Barbara Presidio in 1782. And so this is Galita Valley, see that large coastal lagoon? And you can see these clusters of houses around the lagoon. This is where Indians were living. This is where UCSB is today. And um, then this is Santa Barbara waterfront. And right here, uh, this is the Spanish uh, village, the, the village the Spanish called Montecito, right here at the mouth of Montecito Creek. It's called Shalawa in, in uh, the Chumash, coastal Chumash language right here. This is the bird refuge where the zoo is located right here. Here's the big Chumash town that was right there, uh, right about where Stern's Wharf is today, along the waterfront. And then this is where the Santa Barbara Presidio uh, was being founded. So this is a uh, map from the right at when the Presidio was first being uh, established. Uh, we fast forward a few years, uh, actually 11 years from the, when that last map was made, and you can see here's that Chumash town on the Santa Barbara waterfront. Here's the Presidio in the foreground, and by this time the mission had been established at the end of, uh, uh, they established it right on St. Barbara's Day uh, in 1786. And so it was only uh, less than seven years old when Vancouver uh, visited and uh, this, this sketch was made. It's the first image we have of what the uh, Santa Barbara, uh, what does Santa Barbara look like in those days. Now, one of the things that happened when the Spanish came is they brought a new form of currency with them, uh, glass trade beads. And glass trade beads quickly became more desirable as a prestige item than the, bead, the shell bead money. And so what we see happening is the whole bead money production industry collapsed on the, Santa, on the Channel Islands. They quit making all that wonderful variety of shell beads that had been made, and it was replaced uh, by uh, glass trade beads that the Spanish brought. The glass, glass trade beads are really colorful and attractive and very variety of colors and were sought after uh, by Chumash Indians. 
And so the Spanish mentioned that when they were um, when they were building the Santa Barbara Presidio, they were paying for the labor by paying the Indians with glass trade beads to build the Presidio. And uh, Father, uh, I mean the uh, Comandante, the first Comandante, uh, Jose Francisco Ortega, he wrote a letter saying, you know, if I only had enough glass trade beads, I'd have this Presidio built in no time. You know, because he's hiring the local Chumash Indians to help with the labor of building the, uh, making the adobe bricks and building up the Presidio. Um, at the missions, uh, some of the, the crafts uh, continued, but there were changes that made. For example, this is a, a really a finely made Chumash basket, uh, but she's copied, to, instead of the traditional designs, she's copied designs from Spanish coins. And if you go to our museum today in our uh, Chumash Indian Hall, this is the first thing you see as you enter the room. It's, it's the you know, highest quality basket uh, on exhibit. Uh, the number of stitches per inch, and just the, the overall craftsmanship of it. Uh, so this woman, we know her name because the governor of California, the Spanish governor of California, so prized this particular basket that he had her weave a dedication into the rim of the basket in Spanish that says, you know, that it's made by a woman named Juana Basilia, and that he's... Uh, this Governor Sola, there's a street in Santa Barbara named after him today, Sola. Um, he's giving this basket to uh, a friend of his down in Mexico. And um, it was discovered in Mexico in the end of the 19th century, purchased there and brought up here. And then in the early days of our museum, it was purchased uh, for our museum. But, uh, okay, so this, we can identify this woman because of her. Um, name, Juana Vasilia. We've looked her up in the mission records. She was actually an adult woman who came to, with her husband and small daughter, to Mission San Buenaventura in 1807 and, and was then lived the rest of her life at the mission. And uh, so she can be identified. Because she came from a village near Thousand Oaks, where Thousand Oaks is today. So these, these mission books are very important uh, they have, um, because they have the names of all the people who were baptized. And I'm just going to read one this little uh, entry here, number 1147. You can see each person is named sequentially in the register. And this number in the baptismal register was kind of like their social security number at the mission. Uh, so, you know, if you had two men named Pedro, you, it could be Pedro 1147 or Pedro... Um, 512, for example. You'd know which Pedro you're talking about. Uh, so they would use this number to, to, to reference when, they, when the person would be married or, or uh, had a child or something, they would always be cross-referencing as to who, who he was using this number. Anyway, it says here, I'll translate it, it's in Spanish. On the 12th day of the month of September in the year 1797, uh, I baptized the following adults. First, a man about 60 years of age called Yano Nali, uh, chief, or it says, uh, capitan, or chief, of the rancheria of Siuktun, native of the same uh, rancheria, and father of Mateo Tatu. I gave him the name Pedro. Okay, so this is um, a typical entry in the baptism, book of baptisms. It says how old he is, 60 years old, it says, where he's from, he's a native of Siuktun, which that's the big Chumash uh, town right there where Stern's Wharf is. Uh, he's the chief there at Siuktun. It gives his political status, and it gives his relationship to someone who had been previously baptized. And so this kind of information can be used to uh, study marriage and family patterns, you know, of Chumash Indians at the time of the missions. And I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, first of all, this is a yeah, this is, by the way, Agil Nsweta. He's a Chumash descendant. His grandmother was the last speaker of any of the Ch last birth speaker from birth of any of the Chumash languages. Um, and uh, this is dated. You can see that's a rather old-looking computer. But this is some years ago. But anyway, we we created a database of all this information in the mission records, and um, from that, one of the pieces of it, information you can get is the whole entire settlement pattern 
of all these more than 150 different Chumash towns and villages that existed at the time of the missions. So these, these mission books have the, the village names, the rancheria names, where people came from. And you can, you can therefore, uh, through uh, that plus other sources of information, you can work out the whole settlement pattern throughout out the region. And we can look at interaction, social interaction, and economic, inter well, social interaction, because we can see, um, you know, there would be someone from this town, this is the town of Sa'achbilil, which, which is kind of downtown Goleta today, but Sa'achbilil, uh, and this is looking at where someone from Sa'achbilil was married or had a relative living uh, that is recorded in the mission books. And what you see is this particular village, it had connections to Santa Cruz Island, it had connections up the coast, towards what today is the Hollister Ranch, west of Gaviota, it had connections all the way back into the, um, the Santa Inez Valley area, uh, all the way back into the far interior, and all the way east to Santa Paula and to Carpinteria. So you get an idea of what the social interaction sphere was for people of this particular uh, Chumash town. We also can, can look at the whole how the whole process of missionization proceeded. And so this is uh, looking at the missions, just three missions, Santa Barbara, La Parisima, and Santa Inez in Santa Barbara County. And this is when Santa Barbara Mission was founded. And you can see that for the whole, about the first almost 20 years of the mission's existence, um, that there was a relatively, well, it was fluctuating, but relatively stable number of people that were coming to the mission from the native villages over that period of time. It's not counting children born at the missions. These are people who are being converted from the native population. So there were villages coexisting with the missions uh, all during this period of time. It wasn't a situation where the mission would be founded, everybody's rounded up and brought in. It wasn't like that. It was, there would be this whole period of uh, interaction between the mission and the peop people living in the surrounding area and gradually people were being baptized. And then all of a sudden, we get a major recruitment of almost everybody who's left along the main part of the Santa Barbara Channel in 1803. And then these, this group of people here, these are people from the Channel Islands, and they came in much later than everybody else uh, to the missions. So, um, let me go back a minute. So everybody wants to know you know, the question is often asked, so were they, they forced to come into the missions, right? Well, we can see that there was, there was um, you know, there's no force going on. These are, this is number of people coming, but what I like to say, it wasn't forced conversion, but it was sort of force of circumstances. Because all during this time period, what's happening? Well, the mission um, is, has herds of, grazing animals. And remember, the Chumash Indians were gathering wild seed crops, you know, for their sustenance. And so when the, the herds and flocks of sheep and the herds of cattle began to grow, they're eating those same uh, plants that the Chumash Indians had depended upon for their wild grains. And uh, so they're losing a lot of their food to the, uh, these growing herds of grazing animals that are changing the landscape. And the other thing that's happening, too, is we're getting uh, introduced European diseases coming in. And that's actually uh, mostly affecting the very young. When we have, a, when there's epidemics, uh, people who've studied epidemics around the world, epidemics usually affect the very young and the very old. And so uh, there was a higher infant mortality that begins to develop uh, during this period of time. So by the time this occurs, there's been a lot of change after nearly 20 years of, of coexistence of the, um, the Indians and, and the uh, colonial establishments. And so um, the other thing that happens is there's an argument going on between the missionaries and the secular military government of, of California. The missionaries feel that, that really these Indians are not being truly converted the way they would like. like. And, the only way that'll happen is if they're all under the sort of the 
uh, all living together at the mission, so the missionary really can can be have more of an influence. And uh, while the, the soldiers are thinking that that puts too much power in the hands of the church, and so they want the Indians to be left alone and only convert be converted if the missionary goes out to preach at the villages and, and they decide to be converted. So there's this big argument going on. And in 1803, in the early months of 1803, uh, the, the viceroy in Mexico decides on the side of the, of the missionaries. And so I think that also has something to do here. So it's, it's both an administrative decision by the colonial government and also the fact that all of these changes were taking place that made it hard for Chumash Indians to live the way they always had been living. Any questions about any of that? Okay. So let's, let's go on. We can also chart the uh, effects of diseases uh, very accurately using these, these books, looking at the, the death records, because they're burial records. And you can see that there are uh, spikes here. Uh, the first spike is a diphtheria, what we believe to be diphtheria in 1801. Uh, there's another very uh, bad epidemic that swept through California in 1806 of measles. And many lives were, were lost to these different epidemics. And then another measles epidemic, 1821, and so on. And you'll see the trend over time is, a, is an increasing uh, mortality uh, at, at, among the population, the mission. And, uh, oops, let me go back. So by the time we get to the 1820s, and uh, e even to the end of the mission period in the 1830s, there's only probably about 10% of the population that had been here, you know, some 70 years earlier when the first expeditions had come through. Uh, in 1824, there was a Chumash uprising uh, that occurred at, at three missions, at Santa Inez, La Parisma, and Santa Barbara. This is an artist. Uh, reconstruction of what that may have looked like when the soldiers are attack attacking the Indians at the mission. Uh, the Indians fled and uh, went to the San Joaquin Valley and, and lived there for some months before the president of the missions came down and he and the missionary at Santa Barbara both went out and uh, spoke with the, the rebel leaders and they came to a, an amnesty. Uh, in the 1830s, uh, the missions were secularized, and this is an, an actual um, a drawing that was made of what Mission Santa Barbara looked like in the 1830s. And uh, this is what the town of Santa Barbara looked like at the same uh, time. You can see around that former Presidio, there grew up a Pueblo. As the soldiers retired with their families, they built adobes near the Presidio, and you gradually had a town uh, being built up around Santa Barbara and that there were still Indians uh, up at the mission. Uh, you can see off in the upper left, there's the mission on the hill. But uh, by 1840, the number of non-Indians exceeded the number of, of Indians in the entire region. So at Ventura, the number of Indians at Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Inez was less than the number of non-Indians uh, living in, in Santa Barbara and in, in various ranchos. Because what happened was the, um, the governor of, that was appointed, came from Mexico, uh, Governor Figueroa, he uh, secularized the missions, meaning that the Indians, uh, the, the whole idea had been that the missions were to be established and hold the land and trust for the population and, uh, of the Indians. But as the Indian population dwindled, there was increasing pressure put on the, um, put on the governor of California to uh, release the lands uh, around for ranching. And that's what happened. So there was, in Santa Barbara County, these are all the ranchers that were later on uh, patented under the uh, American government uh, that were given out as grants uh, during the Mexican period. But there were also uh, places where Indians continued to live in our area. And this is a, a map showing those places uh, up into the mid-19th century where there were separate Indian communities in the vicinity of the former missions in our area. At Santa Barbara, the main place where the Indians were living was at a place called La Cieneguita. And um, this was 
right about where uh, uh, Modoc and Hollister roads come together in Santa Barbara is where that Indian community was located. There were adobe houses where the Indians were living and there was a chapel that was built that the missionary would come and visit from the mission to hold services there for the Indians who were living at La Cienaguita. Uh, moving rapidly forward in time, we're up to the 1870s, and this is an Indian couple, uh, Justo and Cecilia, uh, sh shown in front of Mission Santa Barbara. This is the earliest photograph we have of Chumash Indians in Santa Barbara. Uh, around each of the missions I mentioned, there's a, there's a, there are equivalent communities. San Inez also had a, a community of Indians. It's where the reservation is today. Uh, they were the Indians who had been at St. Mission San Inez. And in the, late, in the 1870s, uh, this is the chief, uh, Rafael Solaris. And uh, this is the only photograph in existence of a Chumash man in regalia, full dancing regalia. Uh, he was photographed in the very first photographic studio on State Street in Santa Barbara uh, by a French anthropologist who was visiting and who uh, had this picture made of Raphael in his uh, dancing regalia. And then uh, Raphael's house was sketched in Santa Inez by an artist who lived in Carpinteria, Henry Chapman Ford, and this is uh, what his house looked like there in Santa Inez. And of course, that Indian community became the San Inez Reservation. It was uh, established in 1901, and the Catholic Church owned title to that land. There was a rancho that had been given to the church, the college rancho, and the, um, the Indians were on land, living on land within that rancho. And as long as the church owned it, they're sort of, they couldn't, uh, the land couldn't be taken from them, they couldn't sell it. Uh, and then in 1901, that land was transferred by the church to the federal government to be administered as a reservation. So that's why the San Inez has a reservation there today. In Santa Barbara and Ventura, something different happened. Um, now here's, a, here's an Indian, I'll show you a couple of pictures. This is an Indian house at San Inez right at the turn of the century, an old adobe house. It's right about where the casino hotel is located today. <laughs> and, um, and uh, this is an Indian woman, Francisca Solares, who uh, lived at San Inez, but she had been born at La Cienaguita in Santa Barbara. And her mother had, her father died, and her mother married a man, a uh, second husband at San Inez, so they moved over to San Inez, and she lived the rest of her life at San Inez. And here she is shown uh, at, next to the old hotel in San Inez. She's doing the laundry, and you can see those piles of laundry there. Some of the Indian women um, made their uh, living by, by doing laundry there at the hotel. And what's interesting about her is her, she is the great granddaughter of Pedro Yananale, whose baptism I showed you earlier, and for whom a street in Santa Barbara's name, Yananale Street in Santa Barbara. Anyway, um, Francisca still has descendants living today, uh, so that there's, there's descendants living today who descended from the chief Yananale. Uh, this is uh, San Buenaventura, the way it looked in the 1870s. And you'll see there's a, um, here's the back of the church here. And right here there's a row of houses on what today is called Thompson Boulevard. And um, those were being occupied by Indian families. That was where the Indians lived in Ventura, all along that, that street. And this is a photograph we have from 1873, the first photograph we have of Indians at San Buenaventura. And um, the man holding the violin, the second from the left, that's Juan de Jesus Tumamaya. So he's the, he was the grandfather of Vincent Tumamaya, whose photograph I showed uh, earlier. The uh, tradition of basket weaving uh, continued all the way up to the beginning of the 20th century. And these are two, some of the Indian women who were basket weavers living in those houses there uh, in Ventura. Uh, this Candelaria Valenzuela on the right, Petra Pico and Donaciana uh, Salazar, they're all uh, weavers. Uh, and their baskets are now prized by museums all across uh, the country. Uh, this is another couple, uh, Jose Peregrino Romero, or Winai was his Chumash name 
and his wife Susanna. Uh, Susanna was from Santa Barbara, and they lived there in that Ventura uh, community and have descendants living in Ventura County today and Santa Barbara. This man was Juan Esteban Pico. He was half Chumash, but he was uh, a carpenter. He probably built those houses that were in that photograph in 1870. You see his carpentry tools here. But he was also highly educated, and he was the one that they would bring into court to translate for um, uh, Chumash Indians when they were in, in, uh, brought to court. And uh, what's great about Pico is that he had an interest in writing down information about his culture and his language. And so this is his, in 1884, he made this list of all the places from Point Conception down into the Santa Monica Mountains and their Chumash names. You see how beautiful his handwriting is mm -hmm. on the left. And then that scrawl on the right, that's the, the linguist who interviewed him, you know. But, Pico was actually a better at representing his own language than this linguist was. As you know, linguists have looked at this and said, "Oh, he, he had, he was much more sophisticated in representing the sounds in his language and writing them down." With him was the linguist who was trying to make, uh, trying to record it the best he could. Pico also left behind a manuscript notebook that you see here on how to speak his language and also talking about the material culture of the Chumash and social culture of the Chumash. And so, for example, here on the upper left, he's listing here the different kinds of bead money and how much they're worth, equivalent in peco, pesos. So it's a really important uh, document here. And then below that, he's saying how you count in, his, in the Ventureño Chumash language uh, down below and so on. Another uh, Indian who grew up in Ventura, but whose, his parents had both been born on Santa Cruz Island, was this man here, Fernando Librado Kitsapawit. And he was interviewed by John Harrington in the early 20th century. Um, and uh, Fernando um, uh, knew quite a bit, and Harrington had this painting made of him that you see here. Uh, and here's a photograph taken of John Harrington the tall man here, um, and then here's Librado, and Harrington realized that this was the last living person who had actually participated when he was a boy in building a plank canoe. And when Harrington discovered this, they went up to a lumber yard in Highland, California, and they, uh, had, he had Fernando d direct the building of this plank canoe that you see here. And if you come to our Chumash Indian Hall today, you can see this uh, on exhibit high up over the, the, uh, the door. And here's a picture of Fernando Librado showing John Harrington. John Harrington took this photograph. He's dancing the swordfish dance in this, and he's showing Harrington how the swordfish dance was performed. Uh, Harrington also would, he, he loved to have Indians help him recreate using their knowledge of when they were young, uh, what, their, uh, what things looked like. So for example, the plank canoe, but also this uh, Chumash house that they built uh, at the Ventura County Fair in 1923. And uh, he got together a whole group of Indians from throughout Central California, brought them together at Ventura County Fair, and he, he interviewed them, taking notes about them, and also they were there. He was trying to make get people to appreciate uh, California Indian culture. And so here's a, here's a group photo that he took at the Ventura County Fair. Uh, here's um, this man in, who's sitting in the dancing regalia is a Yokuts man from uh, the central, from San Joaquin Valley. Uh, he was one of the last um, Indian doctors or sham shamans from this part of California. And then the other people sitting behind him are other Indians from around the area. In Santa Barbara, John Harrington met this woman here, uh, Luisa Ignacio Nutu was her Chumash name, and uh, she was a fluent speaker of Barbareño Chumash. Uh, she lived uh, right across from the Historical Museum in Santa Barbara. Her house is still there, and it was last year it was designated a, a city historical landmark uh, 
for, because of John Harrington's work with her uh, in that house. And uh, Harrington worked with three generations in that family. He worked with Louisa, and then the woman in the center is Lucrecia, that's Louisa's daughter. He worked with her, and she accompanied him back to the Smithsonian Institution to do further documentation on the language, the Barbarino language. And uh, then uh, to Lucrecia's left is um, Mary Yi holding her son. Uh, she married a Chinese man, but she was the last living person to speak, uh, be a, birth, a speaker from birth of a, of a Chumash language. And uh, then Harrington's holding Angela, who um, lives today in Wisconsin, but uh, still in touch with her. And then this is Mary Yi. They, she was interviewed on a KTMS radio. Uh, and this is her uncle, uh, Tomas Ignacio. And so we have a a recording, a, ra a, a tape recording of the two of them speaking Barbarino Chumash uh, together as they're being interviewed on KTMS radio. And this brings us down to the present day. Um, uh, these people on the, uh, there's Ernestine de Soto, she's the younger do youngest daughter of Mary Yi. She's, she still, because she heard the Chumash language spoken in her home, for 27 years, you know, when her mother was working with John Harrington and so on. She has a very excellent kind of built-in memory of what the language sounds like. And um, so that linguist who's worked with Ernestine says that she just, she pronounces the words perfectly because she doesn't speak the language, but she knows how, to, how the language sounds and has very good pronunciation. And so, uh, and she's with two of her children there on either side of her and then this over here on the right is Ernestine's second cousin, uh, Carmelita, with two of her sons. And they, um, I, I included this photograph because if you go back in their family tree using the mission records to reconstruct the genealogy, they have an ancestor from Montecito. It, the, the original Chumash village at the mount of the Montecito Creek, uh, they have an ancestor in their family tree that goes all the way back there. And. Uh, so with that, I'll answer any questions anybody has. Thank you. <coughs>